Good afternoon and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's latest webinar. This one is our very first webinar on bird photography and uh, we have uh, an expert on the subject matter, a wildlife photographer, Dave Taylor, and wildlife author as well, and also the education director of the Riverwood Conservancy. So an all-around uh, expert uh, is here to tell us a little bit more about uh, bird photography. Specifically for today, we're looking at the equipment involved. Uh, we'll give a couple more minutes or a couple more seconds anyway for participants to join in to the webinar. Uh, thanks so much again for being here today. And as we go through the webinar, uh, we'll have a presentation from Dave talking about mainly gear. If you have questions, please pop them into the Q&A panel in Zoom and we'll get to as many questions as we can as the webinar goes on. And we'd also like to thank our partners at Armstrong Bird Food for their support of our birding programs. Learn more about them at armstrongbirdfood.com. And after you check out their website, you can also check out ours at theriverwoodconservancy.org. And if you have the financial ability to make a donation, we would very much appreciate that, as of course all of our programming has uh, been severely impacted, as you would imagine, by the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, thanks again for being with us today. Uh, I will turn things over shortly to Dave, who is a wildlife photographer and the author of more than 40 books on wildlife and ecology, and he's produced educational videos and material about wildlife for school curriculums. He has taught science and geography for over 30 years and nature photography and writing for over 25 years, and as I mentioned, currently the education program director here at the Riverwood Conservancy. So without further ado, Dave, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Rashid. And welcome to this first of five workshops we're planning to do on bird photography. Um, we're going to start out by uh, looking at the equipment that you use to get pictures of birds. And there's a few slides playing in the background that will give you some idea of some of the places and shots I've taken. A lot of people think the bird photography begins with something like this. I would imagine this is like the penultimate thing, but most people that take pictures of birds are going to use all sorts of equipment that's a lot less expensive and less cumbersome than this huge 500 millimeter lens that you can see behind me. So let's start with some very small cameras. This is a GoPro. And if you have a GoPro, you probably have never really thought it would be much use in, in bird photography. But the GoPro is one that I've used and, and successfully to photograph birds. Now this has a tremendously wide angle lens, like the widest of any of the equipment you see here. And what I've used before is its timer. So I've used this at a bird feeder where I've mounted it close to the bird feeder, and then I've controlled it with my iPhone or my smartphone. Now, that aside, the other time I've used this was when traveling in Africa and shooting pictures from the vehicle as the animals are very close. But I gotta say, most of the time those animals were not birds, they were things like wildebeest or lions or something. This device I've also found handy for shooting. Uh, a lot of people may have an iPhone and never use it for bird photography, but I've seen videos done with these things that are just excellent, one in penguins in particular. The trick is, again, using the remote qualities. You can fire both of these things remotely from another smart device, and that's the difference. If you have a newer iPhone or smartphone, you will have a variety of lenses now. So this is the iPhone 8. It only has a standard lens. The zoom is not particularly good, and I would not advise you to use it for doing bird photography, because on these older phones, the zoom basically enlarges the picture, but it doesn't increase the number of pixels. So you've got the same number of pixels you'd have in a small space and they're spread out, which affects the sharpness. So I wouldn't use that. I've also used an iPad for bird photography. Um, it works. But now we're getting into what many people would consider the sort of standard entry-level camera. These are the point-and-shoot cameras. Some of them have really remarkable zoom lenses. I was on safari one year and one of my clients had one that had a telephoto lens in his camera that was equal or greater than this one. Um, the problem he had was it was very shaky. 
but he got some good pictures as long as he didn't use it at full telephoto. These are um, good cameras to carry around with you if you're bike, hiking or whatever. They have a relatively good zoom. The pixels and some of them are quite good and the, whole, the picture will hold together. But honestly, um, it's not likely you're gonna use this a lot. Now this particular one is an underwater version and I have used it when snorkeling in the Galapagos to get close to penguins and to pelicans and come up and just take their picture and the birds because it's the Galapagos weren't disturbed. Don't know that you could do that in the Credit River but if you try it good luck to you let me know how that works out um, when you get your camera clean. So now we're going to get into what most people think of the cameras and this will be where we'll spend the bulk of our time. This is a DSLR camera. It is a through the lens camera which means when you look through here you're actually looking out through the lens when you look through here on this camera you're not actually looking through the lens you're actually looking through an image from the lens so this is more true to life these cameras when i started out were pretty mechanical and that was back in the 60s and 70s now they've become computers. They are just, there's more to these things to, than I will ever need and you probably will ever need. But this is probably what you have and I will bet you that there are some things that you're using that you really could be better off not using and some things here that would be really, really helpful if you started to think about it. So we're gonna spend a bit of time looking at just the camera. Again, all of this being talked about through the filter of photographing birds. So if you get your camera, whether you have a Nikon or a Canon or a Sony or a Yamaha, or whatever, um, you probably, if you're a beginning photographer, you're gonna start out with an on program. Great idea, not a great idea. It's a great idea because it basically thinks for you. And if you like doing things without thinking, and I think many of us do, this is perfect. It just really works out well. It'll set your exposure, your aperture, decide what your subject's doing, how's the best way of capturing it. It's done from an algorithm that the camera companies have worked out that says in this situation, this is the ideal exposure, in this situation, this is the ideal exposure. It works and you can generally trust it. However, there are times when you don't want to trust it. You want the camera to do what you want to do. And that's when you get to the next two settings. And this, these are the ones that I would spend most of my time thinking about. TV, which on a Canon camera, refers to the shutter speed. It's a different type of letters on the Nikon. I can't remember what they are. And on the, um, the other one is AV, which is aperture. We'll start with TV, shutter speed because that's the easiest. Shutter speeds can range from about 30 seconds all the way up to, oh, one five thousandth of a second. Uh, it can give you a real range. Why it's important is what the animal is doing. You want to stop the animal or you don't want to stop the animal, in this case a bird. So if you're photographing a hummingbird and you're shooting at even a five hundredth of a second, you are not going to uh, be able to stop its wings. But a bigger bird like the golden eagle you can see, you could stop its wings at 500th of a second. I generally suggest that you shoot, first of all, the general guide rule, if you're shooting with a lens, the length of the lens is the minimum shutter speed that you should use. So this is a 50 millimeter lens. You should be shooting at a 50th of a second. This is a 400 millimeter lens. You can hand hold this. I want you to get over 400 of a second. This is almost a thousand millimeters the way it is. You wouldn't want to hand hold that less than a thousand. And even then, the thing it's not taking into consideration this rule of thumb is that this lens and this lens are almost the same length, but this one's a lot lighter. So I can hand hold it at a lesser speed. So that's a guide rule, but it's not one I really adhere to. What I would suggest you think about 
is the speed of the wings um, or what the bird is doing. A stationary bird, you can shoot at a much slower shutter speed. A flying bird is going to require greater shutter speed. And the larger that bird is, the slower the shutter speed can be. So a hummingbird with small wings going like this, two thousandth of a second might not stop it. But a golden eagle or a turkey vulture whose wings are flapping kind of leisurely like this, what you'll get are the finger, the feather tips blurred, but the bird itself will be pretty much sharp. I would suggest if you're doing action shooting, you go out and you set this at the highest shutter speed that you can get. And boy, that has changed a lot since I started photography. When I started, we had what we call ISO speeds. That's the speed of the film, how fast the film emulsion takes the picture when it's exposed to light. So 64 was Kodachrome, and that was the one that most of us used back in those days, shooting for books and magazines and advertising. It was good, it was sharp, but you couldn't get a lot of speed out of it. You had to have a bright sunny day to get oh, 500 to 750th of a second. These cameras are remarkable. Their ISOs started out, the 400 ISO was about as good as a 64 ISO. Now you're getting up in the neighborhood of 1600 to 2000 ISOs. And the higher the ISO number, the quicker that film reads or the quicker the image is recorded. And so basically what you've got here is the capability of shooting at 2000th of a second in poor light with a very high, S high ISO. Now, the problem with that is you're going to get noise and noise are these funny little things that happen at very high ISOs. And the cameras are getting better and better and better. You spend seven or eight thousand dollars on a new Canon camera, you're going to have very low IS or very low uh, noise in your pictures. If you spend two hundred and fifty dollars on a camera, your noise level is going to go up. And the newer the camera, the less noise. For most of us, that doesn't make much difference. My rule of thumb is get the picture. If the picture requires you shooting at two thousandth of a second and it's going to be a little bit noisy, get the picture, especially if it's a picture of a Sasquatch. Um, it'll be worth its weight in gold. However, so generally with this, now I seldom use the high speed, although I'm changing my mind a little bit on that. Usually I shoot in AV. Now that's the aperture opening. And what an aperture is, it's, it's the opening of the camera. The smaller that aperture is, the less light that's coming in, the less depth of field. The larger that aperture is, the more depth of field. Kind of like, like you're squinting. So if I've got a very small aperture, my depth of field is very narrow, like this. A large aperture, it can be huge. So huge that it can look like you're shooting from, oh, say, a meter in front of you to infinity. It's not true, but that's what it can look like. Um, so I set the aperture for what I want the picture to be like. If, and most of the time I'm shooting portraits of birds, so I'm going to have a very closed aperture. So I'll shoot at uh, f5.6 on these cameras, which means the aperture is as small as it can get, but the shutter speed, no, sorry, I'm gonna reverse that. The aperture is as wide as it can get, and the shutter speed can be as big as it can get. When you shut it down, that's when you're getting the great depth of field. I may have misspoke there. Uh, write that off the nerves. So I will shoot at 5.6 with this camera. Shutter speed will be 2,000th of a second or higher, and I'll determine that by the ISO setting, putting it up if I need it. And that will give me a picture like the one you're seeing now, the heron, where the background is blurred. If you stop it down and make that aperture smaller, the depth of field is going to increase. So in this particular heron, you can see that the plant growth is sharper. So the aperture is a little bit um, smaller, giving me more depth. But that was because of the way the bird was. I wanted to get its bill with a fish in it so that its tail was also sharp. 
And that's something you need to think about. And you've got to make these decisions very, very quickly. Um, if you're flying, if a bird is flying and you've got a very wide open aperture, so I'm a bald eagle and I'm flying past you, my wings are out. If your camera hits this wing tip and that's where you're focusing on, that's a good three feet or a meter from my eye and really you need to get the eye sharp. So that's when you would use a smaller aperture so that you're going to get the tips of the wings right down to the, the head of the bird. Um, again, thinking on your feet. There's a hummingbird that uh, was probably shot at uh, 2,500 of a second in lots of light. So aperture and TV are really important. If I'm doing portraits, my aperture is wide open. If I'm trying to get the bird in its habitat, I close it down. If I'm looking at things like the wing span and I want to get it in focus, I'll close it down. Um, but the more you close it down, the more stuff that's in between you is going to come in focus. So if I'm out there shooting birds flying and they're ducks and it's a blue sky, my aperture is going to be a little bit smaller than if I were photographing songbirds flitting around in the bushes. Just a different technique. Uh, do remember that trick about setting the ISO. Now a friend of mine told me about this trick. Set your ISO on automatic and then set your, set your shutter speed for as high as you want it. And the ISO will change automatically. So it may go from a 400 to 5,000 if the light is low, but you will get the picture. That osprey shows you a good depth. Most of the wingtips are pretty sharp. Swan coming at you, the focus is on the beak of the bird, but the aperture, because there's a lot of light here and there's nothing really in the background, you can see the depth of field. So focusing on birds in flight is really important. So ISO, learn to set it, learn to play with it. Don't be afraid of using higher ISOs. The early books will tell you don't shoot more than 400. The new cameras are so good that you can go beyond that. Now, speaking of cameras, what makes a good camera? Well, Canon has a line of cameras and I shoot Canon primarily. So this camera is considered a semi-pro. It's the Canon uh, 7D Mark II. It ranges around $1,800 for the camera. Now you can go $6,000 and you get a better camera. You can go $500. The difference really is in the quality of the body of the camera. The features tend to migrate. The best cameras have the first, then they migrate to the middle, then they migrate to the end. So if you buy a brand new $500 camera that just came on the market, it'll have features that you would have paid $6,000 for about three or four years ago. There is still a difference. That $500 camera is less waterproof it's less durable. You drop it, it's going to break. You get it wet, it's going to leak. These ones in the middle are pretty good. Pretty good indeed. And the high-end ones are really good. However, you can buy 12 $500 cameras for that $6,000 camera. And if you're male, which I am, and my wife would attest to that, the problem with males is we like to get the newest things. So we're always buying and upgrading our cameras. I don't know if women do this. Um, I expect they probably do. So you buy a camera. This camera is now three, four years old. The new camera, which is the 90, has some features that I would like to have. Am I going to go and trade it in? Well, maybe, maybe not. But I certainly in the past have gone through dozens of cameras in my life as a photographer. I currently, and I'm going to get back to this one in a second, I'm currently shooting a lot of stuff with mirrorless cameras. Partly that's because I'm getting old and these are a lot lighter. Uh, partly because they have features, mainly video, that I'm doing more of. They take really good pictures. This has got 24 megapixels as opposed to 20 megapixels on this camera, uh, as opposed to 18 on the previous one. 
the more megapixels, the more detail you have. So I can take a picture with a 300 millimeter lens on this camera and get the same quality of blow up that I could get with this lens when I was shooting on a generation or two earlier version of the camera. Because the, you, there's just that much more depth. Now, that's not 100% true, but it's pretty close to being 100% true. These mirrorless ones do have some advantages. They're lighter. Um, they are now coming with through the lens capabilities, which the old mirrorless cameras like this one didn't have. Um, but we'll get back to these at a much later date. Let's go back to this one. DSLR cameras have a really good feature, and that is that they have interchangeable lenses. And you can take the lens off. Watch, I'll blow this as I do it. But fairly simple to put them on and change them. If you're going to buy and spend five or six thousand dollars, spend it on the lens. This is what you're going to keep. I've had this lens for about six or seven years. I've had that lens for about eight or nine years. Um, they last well. They're sharp. They're tough. You can get them. You don't want to go swimming with them, but you can get them a little bit wet. They're going to be fine. Um, when you buy a camera and a lens, uh, test them out. Put the lens on the camera. It's sort of a dirty little secret that there are sweet spots. So a camera might be ideal, perfect camera, but may not quite jive with that lens. But if you buy another version of the lens, it might be the same thing. So if you're going to Black, or Black's gone, if you're going to Henry's and you're asking about lenses, just see if you can try it out and then test it out. Always test the lens in the store before you take it and buy it so that you know what you're getting. Um, that's important. Now, what I would be using for bird photography, it's a telephoto lens. 200 millimeter, shortest lens that you want to look at. Um, 300 is better. These 400 millimeter lenses that uh, both Nikon and Canon have, and I think uh, Sony has them now too, are really good quality. They are sharp as a tack. They're expensive, but they're really good. And if you can afford the two or three thousand dollars for a lens like this over the say the four or five hundred dollar lens, go for this one. This one is going to last you a long time, if not a lifetime. You can get zoom lenses and you can get just fixed focus or prime lenses. This one is a 500 millimeter. It doesn't change. It's 500 millimeters. This one goes from 100 to 400. But it's more than that. A lot of cameras, especially below the $6,000 price range, are, have crop sensors, which means they're going to increase the image by 1.6. So it takes a 400 millimeter lens, turns it into a 560 millimeter lens. Unfortunately, it also takes a 28 millimeter lens and turns it into a 40 millimeter lens. So if you're interested in wide angle and scenics, you don't want the crop sensor. If you're a wildlife photographer like me, then you want the crop sensor. I really like it. Although it's less of an advantage now because the megapixels, they've now got cameras coming out with 40 megapixels and 50. They're huge. So I would suggest uh, you really think about that. And I would think when you're looking at the lenses, the zoom lens is the way to go. These days, they're so versatile. Now, when I started selling cameras back when I was a student at Eaton's, some of you will remember Eaton's, um, nobody was really pushing zooms. They were just not the thing. They weren't that good. Today's zoom lenses are that good. I don't know any photographer that doesn't use one. And when I was out shooting, I shoot with another fella. This was his main lens. And I had this thing. And then he got a 300 and it became his main lens. But I always shoot with more than one camera. So I will have typically three cameras on the go. One with a wide angle lens for the scenics, 
the zoom lens and the long lens. And now we're talking shooting grizzly bears or eagles on the nest. But this was the workhorse. And more and more and more, I noticed that when I go out shooting, this is the one that's doing the job. I don't regret buying that thing, but I use that maybe 5% of the time when I'm shooting, whereas the zoom lens, I will shoot that probably 95, maybe 90, because I use the wide angle occasionally. This is the workhorse. And my friend, now that he's moved into higher megapixels, he no longer uses the long telephoto lens. I haven't seen him carry it for a long time. You'll still see these lenses out here. If you go down to Sam Smith Park, when the um, tree swallows are nesting, you'll see all sorts of guys with this kind of stuff. And it's really nice that they have it, but they're limiting themselves. If that tree swallow lands 10 feet closer, they can't shoot. But with this lens, you can shoot. And more and more, I'm seeing people carry both of these things or just this. So that's the lenses. My recommendation would be to get a good 100 to 400. And then this little gizmo here is a teleconverter. This is a 1.4 teleconverter. It adds the length of the lens, multiplies it by 1.4. So 1.6, 1.4. So this 100 to 400 lens is equal to almost a thousand millimeters. Now, when I started going to Africa, leading safari back in the late 80s, I had a 500 millimeter lens that I took with me. And that wasn't the equal of this. This does a far better job. And now when I travel, I don't take that big thing with me. I haven't taken it for the last couple of safaris. But I, if I'm driving someplace, I'll take it with me. So teleconverter is a good thing. One other thing to capture, and then we'll go back to asking questions if you like, and that's these things. Got to have a word about tripods. Tripods, and you can see this one so close. Tripods are these little three-legged things. I don't like monopods. Some people love them, but I, I find that I'm not very good at monopods. But tripods are like, now I've used these tripods for various things. But I would suggest that when you look at a tripod, you get yourself a good one, you invest in it, they'll run you anywhere from 500 to a couple of grand. Uh, you want to get it light, and then you want to make it versatile. Now, tripods, some, I've seen tripods that are taller than, way taller than me. I've seen tripods that are just you know, about a hip to here, and then so there's a real range. You want it sturdy, you want it light, you want to be able to feel like you can carry it with you when you go out. Invest in a good tripod and then invest in a good tripod head. Now, most tripods that you buy, the cheaper ones will come with a head that's got a stick on it. You don't want that. You want at least a ball and socket tripod. And so this is a ball and socket. You can see there's a ball in the socket and you've got great flexibility. You can move it around. It does the job for you. It's very solid. They're not cheap, but they're worth getting. The other one that a lot of people, I'm going to stand up so you lose my head for a minute. It's what they call a gimbal tripod head. It has a lot of mobility up and down. I'll tie it now. Swing it around. I like to think of it as if I'm some sort of gunner. On a plane, you can shoot up and down. Think of me as Luke Skywalker. Works very well. Um, it's got a lot of movement, a lot of freedom of movement. It does a great job. And these things, these are Jabu. Jabu is a Canadian manufacturer. You might be familiar with Wimberling. Jabu is in Toronto, just south of the QEW off Kipling Road. Um, I've had great luck going in there, buying them, meeting the owner. Um, they also sell really handy little things like this that fit on the bottom of your camera or your lens that fit into the type of slide that's on the 
the tripod hit, which means I can use this camera with that. Otherwise, I'd have to take this camera, that head off, put it on this. Really handy little thing to have. And they're not very expensive. Okay. Rashid, do we have any questions? You do. And we can get we can get to the questions uh, right now if you're if you're in uh, feel like you've wrapped up uh, got enough of the uh, presentation out of the way for today I think we can uh, move on to some questions. You still have to do this for forty five hours at Humber. Yes. <laughs> this, is, this is good. This, this is a good uh, intro. This is a good crash course. And uh, one of the questions uh, from a couple of people uh, was, can you suggest a good camera for a beginner in bird photography? So what would be good for someone who's just starting out and wants to take some good bird shots? Okay. So that's a really good question. If I were back three or four years ago, I would say go Canon or Nikon. They were really doing well. Their percentage of the market has slipped a lot. So I would still look at them. I think they're really good cameras, but you might want to look at uh, Sony. You might want to look at, uh, oh, what's the other brand? Can't remember it. But some of these new mirrorless cameras that are coming out. The trend today is to go mirrorless. These cameras, because they're lighter and they have adapters that will take all these big lenses, it's the way that things are going. And they have more features uh, than these cameras do. So I would really suggest you consider looking at these type of cameras. But if you want to get a DSLR camera, look at the four or $500 range. That's a good starting point. Even in these cameras, you're going to look at between oh, $500 and $1,000. Um, check, pick it up, test it. I went with Canon because Canon fit my hand better than Nikon. I like the feel of it. And that was back in 68 at Eaton's when I was talking to the Canon rep, and I talked to the Nikon rep too. I just liked the Canon feel and I've stuck with it. Uh, you want to think about how it fits in your hand, where the grip is, where your trigger is. Uh, one of the things I like in Canon is it has this back button that I can do all my focusing with. So I can push the back button in, you have to set it up. But you push the back button in, take your finger, thumb off that button, it'll hold its focus. So if the bird is in a tree and you don't want to keep focusing every time you push the button down, it's really good. Those are features that you kind of want. I would always, always, always go for the lens quality over the camera quality. That's just, just the rule. Um, and I would look at used cameras. So this camera was $1,700 when I bought it. You might be able to pick one of these things up for $500 to $600 or $700 used at uh, Henry's when you can go back in and look at their stock. Um, used cameras are pretty good. I mean, they've, they're warranty and you'll get a lot more camera for the money, but check against the newer models just in case it has the feature you need. Okay, okay. Uh, next question, kind of a two-parter. Uh, any advice on how to focus on flying birds? Uh, that's uh, obviously a challenge. And what's the best metering setting for shooting flying birds? Because uh, at least from one of our participants, uh, underexposed shots end up being the uh, end result of most of the time. Okay, so every photographer is going to run into this. You're, you're on a bird, it's a, it's a hawk, and it's taken off against the forested background, and then it immediately flies into the sky. Your camera is set the way it's set. It's not going to, most of them won't make the adjustment from trees to bright blue sky. So one of the things that you want to look at in the camera is the ability to very quickly open your camera up. So when that hawk gets against that bright sky, uh, you're, especially if it's backlit, you're opening up. So the sky is going to go whiter, but you're going to pick up the detail in the hawk that you would have gotten down here. Uh, against the trees. So there is no simple answer. The answer is practice and practice and make mistakes and then go back and say, what did I do wrong? The one thing that I've started to do is I've learned how to very quickly, particularly on this camera, because it's got the dial right on top, 
if the bird changes from one location to another, I can just dial that from plus one to minus one very quickly and get the, continue to shooting, continue shooting. Now, the focus part is a problem. Um, we have a tendency when something's going by us, we're up shooting, you're watching the bird, you're trying to fall, you're clicking away, you lose the focus on it. So what I read recently, and I would agree with this, is stop shooting and require the focus. Make sure you get back in focus before you start shooting. On rapidly flying birds, it is tricky, very tricky, but with practice, you'll get it. Um, I mean, we were getting pictures back in the old days when we could fire one picture at a time, then we had to cock the camera and fire another one. These ones will do 10 frames a second. This one will do 20 frames a second, um, which basically means you're wasting a lot of pictures. Uh, but you will get that one shot. So birds flying, particularly at the waterfront, practice, get out there, and even at the waterfront, starts against the blue sky, flies across towards the setting sun, or into the sun, the sky goes white over there, you're going to have problems with the exposure. Um, if a bird is up in a tree, I learned this with a friend of mine, because he got a great picture and I got a crappy picture, it was a picture of a hawk, a kestrel sitting in the tree, he opened his up, I didn't. Mine was a silhouette. His was a lovely picture with all the colors of the kestrel. So from then on, I started saying, hey, knucklehead, you want to open your camera up at least a stop, and sometimes two stops. And one of the great advantages of these things is you can take the thing and look at it and say, oh, I underexposed or overexposed that picture, and then you can correct it, especially if it's a sitting bird. If it's a flying bird, you better hope another duck comes by in a few minutes after you do that. And moving from uh, flying to still birds, uh, another question from someone who has a uh, Canon Rebel T5i with a 135 millimeter lens mm -hmm. who always fails to do still bird photography. So I guess the problem is just getting the, the still shots. Uh, any suggestions for that person? I, I sympathize with you. When I started out, um, I could photograph animals moving, but I could have a moose in front of me standing stock still and it'll be out of focus. So there's a couple of solutions. Use a tripod. Use a tripod and that's gonna help a lot. Get yourself really steady, really steady. All elbows in, holding it tight against you. That'll help, because now basically you're becoming the tripod. You got three points of contact with the camera. That will help a lot. It won't guarantee it, shoot at a higher shutter speed, the higher the shutter speed, the less jitter. Every picture you take needs to be processed, unless you are a remarkable human being, and I've only met one of those at a gallery down in Jordan that's since closed. He only he did every, all the processing in camera. He really understood the computer here. Um, for you, and that'll be the last thing we'll talk about in a few weeks' time is, how to process these things appropriately. But hold your camera steady, and then it might be that you got a crappy lens. That's also a possibility. Uh, in the old days, when I was photographing that moose, I had a lens that could not handle orange light in the evening, and that happened to be an evening shot. So the focus was always a little bit off, and there was nothing I could have done about it to correct it. So, Test your lens out, go and photograph a brick wall and see if you can see all the cracks sharp or photograph a signpost. Test your lens, see if it is the lens. If it is the lens, replace it, get it repaired, whatever. But, uh, but start with trying to get steadier and shooting at a higher shutter speed. And, uh, still on the topic of lenses, uh, from someone who likes to rent lenses, uh, do you think a place like Vistec would rent uh, a 100 to 400 millimeter lens that you had uh, on display, or is that something that's a little bit too precious to be renting out? Oh no, when I was teaching at Humber, I think it was Vistec that rented them. Uh, many of my students would rent a lens, uh, and sometimes, I'm not sure if it was necessarily Vistec, so don't hold me to the company, but they would uh, apply the cost of the rental to the purchase of the lens. 
Um, so the rental was actually kind of a bit of a guarantee that you'd come back with it, I suppose. But many of them have rented it. I know professional photographers uh, that would rent from Canon. Um, if, if you join the Canon professional, I think it's CPS, they used to belong. You have to pay 150 bucks or something a year to it. If you join that, you can rent the cameras or the lenses to test them out. A lot of professionals do that. It's a good idea in one sense. So if you're only going to use this bruiser once in a year, rent it. It's fine. Um, if you're thinking about buying one of these and you're not sure that it's the lens for you, rent it, use it for a weekend. Um, most of the students that I had, and we're talking adult students here, most of them wound up, I think, buying the lens in the long run, but they might have tried two or three versions of it. And there are off-brand lenses that are really just as good as the Canon lens or the Nikon lens. So check those out too when you're looking for a lens. Right, but we are going to have a, a full tutorial uh, episode, you want to call it, uh, on photo editing and processing a little bit later on. Uh, but we did have a question just on quick tips, if you had maybe just a couple that you can uh, tease out for today uh, on editing photos and do you do a lot of uh, photo editing? Uh, yes, I do. I just uh, had to do, uh, I'm in the process of completing a, a book on black bears and the editor uh, wanted me to do some stuff with the pictures. So I had to do a lot of photo editing. Um, the pictures were sharp enough for the first edition of the book, but we wanted to up the game. So we did. So I started with Photoshop. I think if you don't have Photoshop CC, you should get it. Um, it's a, I think it's a hundred dollars a year. And that comes with Lightroom, which is well worth it. Uh, when I was teaching at Humber, you could go into the store. Now I haven't taught for Humber for about seven or eight years now. So it just, I came, I left Humber when they, they started doing the, the downloading of these programs. Uh, you can go into uh, the Humber store and you can get Photoshop for about half of what you would pay for it online if you were a student. So I tell, told my students, hey, it's worth just signing up for my class to go and buy Photoshop. You're, you're ahead of the game. Um, nowadays for a hundred bucks, that program is always evolving. You're always getting the newest program. I really like it. Um, I think it's got a lot of features on it. It's getting better and better. You can do an awful lot with it. And it has all sorts of plugins. So I would start it with Photoshop and learn it. Photoshop Elements is pretty good. Uh, a lot of people, if that's all you're doing is pictures, it's great. But I would start it with uh, Photoshop. And certainly when we do the tutorial in, the, in a number of weeks from now, that'll be what I'll be doing it on, at least for some of it. Uh, it's a, it's a really good program, but there are other ones out there. There are free ones that you can use with a picture. Always sharpen it and always manipulate the color, the the color, the the exposure. Um, those are the two couple of things I always do. Uh, I, I must be doing it right because publishers will ask you not to do them, send them to them raw or whatever. I always send them manipulated and don't get them sent back and get them used so obviously whatever it is i'm doing is probably okay um but never send a picture straight from your camera and that brought up the term raw there uh wasn't going to talk about this today but you can shoot in various there's various terms for the term raw but let's say raw because that's what nikon and canon use raw takes huge pictures. It takes all the information, stores it. You're shooting in RAW. If you've got a, a 32 gig card that'll hold say 5,000 JPEGs, it'll hold 100, maybe 1,250 RAW pictures. It takes a lot of energy, a lot more space. So the advantage of RAW is when you edit it, you don't change the picture, you don't alter the picture, it's always kept for you. You can change the settings. If the color balance was off, you can change it. If the, it just gives you a lot of control. I don't shoot very much raw. I shoot JPEG most of the time, 90% of the time. The reason I do that, 
mainly is because I shoot a lot of pictures. I'm going, to, you know, I use the motor drive. If you use a motor drive, raw slows that down. I've had no problem marketing my pictures in J, as JPEGs. And um, the, with the JPEGs, it just, for me, you get more of them and it shoots faster. So I shoot JPEG, but um, RAW is getting much, much better than it used to be. And maybe that I will finally, at my friends urging, convert to RAW and, and carry bigger CF cards with me when I go out and shoot. I'm old, but I can change. You say that now. Uh, but yeah. uh, last question, I think, uh, that we'll get to for today. And uh, before we get to the last question, and again, just a reminder that we will have more of these webinars, and Dave will explain more elements of bird photography as we go through them. And if you have a look at our website at theriverwoodconservancy.org, you can see the other webinars that we have coming up, both bird photography and otherwise, uh, be sure to sign up for them uh, early. And so last uh, question that we'll get to for today, sure. uh, back to the iPhone, which I know is probably not uh, your camera of choice, uh, but do you have any tips on getting good bird uh, photos from an iPhone? Okay, I would start by buying a new iPhone. <laughs> this is the eight. I would really like one with the three lenses. Um, so I would look at that. The trick with using this for bird photography is go to places where the birds are going to be around. So you can see the sign behind me, this Armstrong Wild Bird Trek at Riverwood. We feed the birds there, unless we have a COVID break. Um, we feed them daily and the birds are very used to people coming in and you can get quite close to them and if you're patient, and you stand very quietly, you'll be able to get some pretty good pictures of birds. Uh, failing that, um, there are other places around Mississauga where you can get close to birds, maybe, maybe not songbirds, but ducks and geese you can get quite close to. That can be a real learning experience. You know, when I was a young person a long time ago, I was really interested in photographing big game animals. That was the thing I wanted to do. And I talked to somebody and said, well, if you want to photograph big game animals, start with a little game. Learn how to photograph a groundhog or a chipmunk or a squirrel. And I would say the same advice to a photographer using this phone or a camera. Start with the stuff that's common. Start with the stuff that's around you. I notice that people seldom take pictures of robins because robins are always around there but how many times have you seen a really really great picture of a robin or for that matter a gray squirrel um, people just ignore them so during this uh, covid break um, i go for a walk every day to do my 5k i carry this and i carry a camera with me i've photographed i think 60 species now not with this necessarily, but it's just remarkable what's in the neighborhood. And you, boy, you can hear them a lot better. Um, you can find them a little bit easier. And some of the birds are quite accommodating. If you want to get really professional, get yourself a small tripod, not this tripod, but they're, this tripod actually would do because you can get an adapter to hold your phone. Put the phone down where you know birds are going to come, like a bird feeder or like a spot where you see wild turkeys regularly and then get an ipad connect the two together go sit back in the bush wait watch and take pictures and of course the bottom line is put a bird feeder by your window and have fun just don't rely as much on the zoom on these ones as you would on the newer models i hope that helps I think it does, and it also helps me. It, it was a good question, a good answer, because it also helps me segue very nicely into another thing that we'd like to promote, which is uh, an upcoming webinar that we're going to have specifically on attracting wild birds to your backyard and how you can use bird feeders and bird baths to get more 
uh, wild birds coming to your backyard. So again, more information of that is on our website. And I want to thank Dave again for his time today and his expertise. We'll have more <laughs> webinars on bird photography coming up uh, in the next few weeks. And I also want to thank our partners at Armstrong Bird Food for their ongoing support of our birding programs at Riverwood. And we do hope to have uh, more of our regularly scheduled programming at the park back again soon. But of course, for the meantime, we're doing our best to manage with the uh, restrictions in place because of COVID-19. And as a result, we have had uh, a number of our events canceled, in fact, all of our events canceled. So as we are shifting more of our work online, and if you can support uh, us to continue more of these webinars, of course, we would very much appreciate a donation again at our website, theriverwoodconservancy.org. And that's all for today. Again, Dave, thank you so much for your time. One final thing, go ahead. I, I go on Facebook occasionally. I haven't been on as much as I should be, but I'm seeing some pictures done by, in one case, a former student of mine that I taught when she was in grade four or five, doing an excellent job. I see some of your pictures out there. I don't know who's in the audience, but if you post your pictures on Facebook and draw them to my attention, I'd be happy to see them. And between now and the next class, go out and try and photograph birds in flight, and we'll see. We can't help you with, with that in the next session. Thanks, Rashid. This was a delight as usual. Always a pleasure to work with you. Oh, thank you, Dave. Uh, appreciate it and appreciate everyone's time uh, who joined us today. And we hope to see you again very soon. For now, take care. Take care. Bye-bye.